We're in the eighth week of this sermon series titled Possible. Everyone say possible. And today I want to pick up where we left off last week with the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 because there's more to the story. And I want to go from John's gospel and, and move into Mark's gospel. Remember last week I said that this might be more about teaching than it is feeding. This isn't just about Jesus feeding the crowd some bread, y'all. It's so much more. There's more to the story. It's more about Jesus teaching the disciples who he was. Because remember in John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And in John 6, 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread. So this isn't just about physical bread, is it? This is about spiritual bread. Physical bread feeds our physical hunger or need, while spiritual bread feeds our spiritual hunger and need. And the title of my sermon today is There's More to the Story. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's more to the story. Come on, how many know there's more to the story? There's more to your story. There's more to your neighbor's story. The person sitting behind you, there's more to the story. There's more to your story, Joel. There's more to your story, Dave. There's more to the story. Every one of us have a story. Stories that are still being told. And in Romans 5, 3 through 5 in the Message Bible, it says there's more to come, more to the story. We continue to shout our praise even when we are hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us. How many feel like you're in a season where God is trying to develop passionate patience in you? Anyone in the house? Let me keep reading. And how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue keeping us alert for whatever God will do next in alert expectancy such as this we're never left feeling shortchanged quite the contrary we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit see your story is still being told believer and even though God already has your story written out completely, page to page, from cover to cover, there's more to it. There's still more to your story. There's more to come. It's still being played out. And God wants to get glory from your story. Come on, He wants to get glory from our story. How many want God to get glory from your story? Let me see your hand. Your story with all the mishaps, and the wrong turns, the bad decisions, the ups and the downs, the revisions, that story. Think of David. story. King David, the, the boy who became a king but was also an adulterer, that story. How about Abraham, the father of, of many nations, yet he made a wrong decision and gave birth to a child that he should have never gave birth to. He gave birth to a nation, church, that he should have never given birth to. That story. Or how about Moses' story? Led two million people out of the wilderness, but then was not even able to enter into the promised land because he disobeyed the voice of God and struck the rock instead of speaking to it. That story. Or how about Mary and Joseph? Or the other Joseph in the Old Testament? Or this Joseph? Or the Apostle Paul? Or Simon Peter? Or how about this little boy in the story? Remember that from last week? His story brought God glory, church. This little boy... And the story is still being told because of a little boy's willingness to obey, to, to give up his lunch. 
Each of you have a story that God wants to use for his glory. I don't care what your past looks like. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how sinful your life has been. I don't care what mistakes you've made. I don't care what you were labeled as a child. God has a book with your name written on it. And he will, he plans, he wants to get glory from your story. If you will commit your life to him, if you'll surrender to him, even your past, he can get glory from it. All right, let's jump into the, the passage for the day. We're in Mark 6, 34. The Bible says that Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, the, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the nearby farms and villages to buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you feed them. And and then, of course, Simon Peter speaks up as he always does and says, with what? (laughs) With what, Jesus? We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all of these people. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for the anointing power of Holy Spirit to speak right here, right now, through this vessel on the stage. I pray for an anointing that would transcend any anointing that I've ever stood and preached in, God, that's ever been on this stage. I pray for that anointing to touch every heart in this place, every heart online, every ear that that hears this word today. God, it would be opened by Holy Spirit to receive a word from the Father. God, even a story that's been told a zillion times, been preached a zillion times, we've even heard it a few, that you would speak something new into the hearts and the lives of your people on this day. I thank you for this word. God, I pray that it will speak to these people as much as it spoke to me this week. We thank you. Have your way in your mighty name. Amen. See, the Bible says that Jesus taught them many things. How many would say that you've been taught many things by Jesus? Come on, how many have been taught many things through his word? And God's word translation, it says that he spent a whole lot of time teaching them and 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 jesus wants to teach us church he wants to teach us many things he 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 wants us to to teach us the same things that he taught them because remember he's the great teacher right and the great teacher is always teaching he never stops teaching and he doesn't just want to entertain us this morning there's too many churches today entertaining their people jesus doesn't just want to entertain us he doesn't just want to encourage us this morning no he wants to teach us He wants to grow us because if we're not growing, we're not going anywhere, y'all. We're just stagnant. But unfortunately, the Bible says that there'll come a time when people just want their ears tickled. Reach over and tickle your neighbor's ear. Come on. You can't say your ear wasn't tickled in this church now. Right? A a lot of the... um, American church, the modern day church, just want to be patted on the back, but not corrected, not not taught. Go ahead and pat your neighbor on the back. Now you feel good. But this is prophecy, y'all. It shouldn't surprise us that, that people just want to be encouraged. They just want to be entertained. They don't want to be changed. Think about it. I should have made that a point that people just want to be entertained. They don't want to be changed. But, but Jesus wants us to change. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to grow us. He wanted to teach this crowd on this day more than he wanted to feed them, y'all. But I will say this. He fed them so that he could teach them. The Bible says that he had compassion on the crowd because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The Passion Translation says they were wandering sheep. The Amplified says they were lacking guidance. In Matthew's Gospel, it says they were harassed and helpless, lost and confused. And that's what Jesus saw. 
He saw wandering sheep. He saw sheep without a shepherd. He saw harassed and helpless sheep. He see, saw lost and confused sheep. And that's why he was moved with compassion, church. Because he saw their spiritual condition in this moment. He was moved with compassion. And I believe with all my heart that he still moved with the same compassion over the crowd as he looks out over our culture and over our world today as he was on this day, if not more so. He still sees wandering sheep, y'all. He still sees sheep without a shepherd. He still sees their spiritual condition. He sees their, their heartache, their pain, their past, their eternity. He sees their lack of guidance and direction. The Bible says that without a vision, the people perish, and he sees sheep without a vision. Wandering sheep. He, he sees shepherds without a vision, shepherds that are leading churches with no vision. His heart is broke. He's moved with compassion. He sees sheep that are living in confusion and, and deception today, and that breaks his heart. Remember that the Bible says that the Son of Man didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to seek and to save, right? That's John 3, 17, which comes right after the infamous John 3, 16, which most of you have memorized, right? How many would say, I have that verse memorized? Okay, how many would be willing to stand up right now and quote it? Come on, the Bible says, be ready in season and out of season. You didn't know you were coming to preach today, but God did. Go ahead and stand up and quote it for us. Hallelujah, thank you. Come on, let's give her a great big hand. That whoever, come on, that whoever believes in him. Do you know a whoever? Come on, you, you, you work with a whoever. You, you might share a home with a whoever. You might live across the street from a whoever. You might go to school and be on a team with a whoever. We all know a whoever. The Bible says, how can they hear unless we tell them? Not the pastor, not social media. Not, not the radio, not the TV. No, it says you, unless you tell them. And so that means we got to start opening up our mouths, right? And, and letting them know what's at stake. So help me out. God sent his son into the world to do what? To save the world. Okay, now help me out. He, he didn't send his son into the world to do what? To condemn the world and, and remember Jesus said just as the father has sent me into the world I am sending you so help me out why did Jesus send you into the world believer to save it to, to save it what did he not send you into the world to do to condemn it mm. but if we're not careful we can get a holier than thou mindset religious mindset and start condemning the very people that jesus died to save y'all think about it jesus said in luke 6 37 do not judge or you will be what do not condemn or you will be what forgive and you will be if we could all get that oh my goodness this place will be packed out in verse 36 jesus said you must be compassionate just as your father in heaven is when we see people that are far from god when we pass them on the street when we work with them when we read their crazy ludicrous just insane social media posts are we moved with compassion or are we moved with condemnation come on let, let's be real in the house of god today let, let's don't be religious let's be real in the house of god today are you filled with compassion or condemnation Jesus wants us to be filled with compassion, church, not condemnation. When you look at the crowd, do you see lost, sinful, confused people? Yeah, we do. Do you see bound, broken, addicted, messed up people? Yes, it's, it's true. People in, in our eyes, if we're not careful, can seem too far gone. But church, Jesus still sees sheep without a shepherd. Come on, he still sees wandering sheep. He still moved with the same compassion today, not condemnation. He sees the rest of their story. 
He sees there's more to their story. He sees a story where he wants to get glory. And he wants us to see what he sees. He wants his church to see what he sees. He wants us to be moved with compassion today and not condemnation. He sees lost sheep. And remember just how important the lost sheep are to Jesus. Remember in Luke chapter 15, the Bible says that he left the 99 righteous to go after the one lost sheep. But let's make this relevant. Let's just say that Jesus was here today. Although he is here spiritually, he's not physically, right? No one sees Jesus, right? He's not, he's not literally in the room, but he is spiritually. But let's just say he was sitting there on the front row. You know what he might do right now? He might leave us, y'all, and go find the one lost sheep. You know that homeless guy that you passed on the way to church today? You, you, you know that prostitute that's out there selling her body? Come on. Uh, the one that's addicted, shooting up, the, the messed up, and maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a neighbor, co-worker, someone you went to school with. Jesus might just leave this service and go find all the lost sheep because that's what good shepherds do he, he's called the good shepherd throughout the gospels he calls himself the good shepherd you know what a lost dying world needs today a good shepherd you know what we need standing in the pulpits today good shepherds we need good shepherds leading good churches compassionate Churches, not condemning churches. Point number one, a confused culture needs a compassionate church. I said a confused culture needs a compassionate church, but don't misinterpret this. Don't, don't take away anything other than, don't misinterpret this. Let me say this. The last thing that a confused culture needs is a confused church. A church that's just as confused as culture, that's blending in, that's, that's trying to, to be just like culture and compromising the word of God, watering it down, and not standing on the truth of God's holy word. A confused culture does not need a confused church. It does not need a complacent church. It does not need a compromising church. It does not need a conforming church. The Bible says to come out from among them and be holy, to be a light. An example. A confused culture needs a compassionate, courageous church. Come on, a righteous church, a saved, redeemed, and filled with the Holy Ghost church, being sanctified daily and not conforming to the pattern of this world. And don't mis misinterpret conviction for condemnation. Preaching truth, repentance, and righteousness is not condemnation. Y'all know that's truth. And that's the full gospel. A gospel that saves, that redeems, and sets men free from their sins, redeems them from a life of addictions and, and, and sin. And that's what we're called to do. If we're just preaching compassion without repentance, we're preaching a false gospel. A, a gospel that will condemn both the deliverer and the receiver. Unfortunately, the world is just looking for a compassionate gospel, a gospel that pats me on the back and, and lets me live in sin and, and do whatever I want to but come to church and feel good and then go out and do it all over again. That is not the gospel whatsoever. That's a false gospel. And Jesus calls this blind guides. In Luke 6, 39, he said, the blind cannot lead the blind because they will both fall into what? The pit. And what does the pit represent? The pits of hell. A blind, confused, compromising church cannot lead a blind, confused culture because they'll both fall into the pit. The pits of what? Hell. In the Message Bible, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd, his heart broke. And this really hit me this week. When, when, when Jesus looks out over our world today, as he looks out over our culture today, as he looks out over the modern-day church, I believe his heart is just as broke because he sees the full picture, the whole picture, the, the, the whole story, the end of the story. In John 3, 18, it says, Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. 
But you know, there's more to the story. There's more to the passage. There's more to the scripture. It says, but whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already. Condemned to what? The pit, y'all. So how, how many have this verse memorized? John 3, 18. Why not? Come on, we have John 3, 16 memorized. Why shouldn't we have John 3, 18 memorized? Because although Jesus does love them, and, and I'm gonna remind you just how much he loves them this much. He gave his life so that they might have life, abundant life, everlasting life, eternal life. He wishes that none would perish, but all would come to the saving knowledge of him. But although he does love them that much, if they don't believe in him and receive him, if they don't repent of their sins, he will have to condemn them. And that's what breaks his heart. That's why he's so heartbroken, because he doesn't want to condemn them. It's ultimately... They condemn themselves by not receiving and believing Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so this breaks his heart. And you've heard this preached before. What breaks his heart should break our hearts. Jesus wants his church to see what he sees. He, he, he wants his church heart to beat just as his does. He wants us to come to the realization and the revelation that if they don't repent and receive him, he will have to condemn them and them being your family members, your coworkers, your classmates, your neighbors, them will be condemned. God forbid, but if them that haven't received Jesus Christ, that haven't repented of their sins, that do not believe in him, if they were to die today, God forbid, they would spend an eternity in hell. Not a day, y'all. It's not a, what's the word, visit. What do you do in school? A field trip. It's eternity. And that should break our hearts, just as it breaks his. That's why he's filled with compassion for them. Jesus sees their story. He sees stories that could be used for his glory, church. But you know what else he sees? He sees stories that will never be used for his glory. People that will never repent and turn to him. And that breaks his heart. When Jesus saw the crowd, how did he respond? With what? Compassion. But did you know the disciples didn't respond the same way as Jesus did? There's more to the story. Let's go to verse 36. The disciple says, send the people away. Send the people away so that they can go to their, the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. The disciple said, send them away. And I wonder how many people that we've sent away. Come on, let that sink in today. How many people have you sent away, hungry people, hurting people, people that are wandering, lost, sinful people with no shepherd, broken, bound, battered, addicted people. How many people have you sent away? I wonder how many people the church has sent away in condemnation. You don't look like us. You don't talk like us. You don't dress like us. You don't act like us. Maybe find another church where you can fit in. Uh, We've, we've, we've got people that come here that have told me that. They've got kicked out of churches because they weren't perfect. We get phone calls weekly at the church on people that need help. It's hard to turn anyone away. You know, I, we don't want to turn anyone away. We want to help everyone. But obviously, we're not able to meet every single need, right? We don't have the resources. We don't have the means. We, we do what we can, but wisdom has also taught us that we need to make sure we use wisdom with helping people like i'll buy someone a meal i'll meet a need in their life I, but, but i'm not going to give them a 20 dollars bill y'all because wisdom has taught me that they'll feed their addiction and not their stomach you understand what i'm saying I, we're not called to be enablers but we are called to meet needs we're called to do what we can and, and leave the results up to God. You can't outgive God. When, when you're helping them, you're helping Him. We have to understand that we, we do what we can and we don't need to send them to the other church down the street. We don't send them, need to send them to the pastor. You know, I've got people that call me and say, so and so, if your church told me to call you. 
I was like, really? I thought we were the church. Huh? You meet the need. Don't send them to me. You, you meet the need. If you've got the means, meet the need. Do what you can. Think of how many people you saw this week that needed help. Come on, that needed to be fed, that needed to be found, that needed to be rescued, that needed to be saved. People that were harassed and helpless, lost and confused. People that Jesus wants to feed and teach, touch and transform. People with stories, church. Sad stories. Difficult stories, heartbreak stories, stories that could be redemptive stories, stories that could bring God so much glory. Think, think of someone. You, you know that God gets the most glory from the stories of people who've overcome the most stuff. How many have overcome something? You have a story, a, a story for God's glory but that's not the end of the story y'all there's more to the story someone in your story brought you to Jesus right now think about it what if that someone would have sent you away you might not be here today how many are thankful for that someone in your life that brought you to Jesus come on tell them today how thankful you are in verse 37 Jesus said, you feed them. Come on, turn to your neighbor again and say, you feed them. And now say, who, me? The voice, that's, that's what we do, right? When Jesus says, you talk to them. I can't. It's the pastor's job, God. Send someone else. The voice translation says, why don't you give them something to eat? And Jesus said, you feed them, not someone else. If not, you who? If you have the ability, the means, the resources, and the time, then you feed them. And Jesus is speaking of both physically and spiritually here. But no, in the passage, the physical comes before the spiritual, which is almost always the case. You've heard this before. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? How many know that to be true? It's true, right? If it's true, say amen. amen. Jesus said, you feed them so that I can teach them. You feed them so that I can reach them. Many times, their spiritual need is met by first meeting their physical need. If you feed their stomach, then you can feed them spiritually, right? Many times, that's, that's just the way it, it works. Tommy Barnett, the great pastor in Arizona, said, find a need and meet it. And, and, and then you can, feed, you can save their soul. If you find a need in the community and then meet it. You've probably heard this verse before, and it says, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Right? How many have heard that verse before? That's Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Jesus said, when you do it for them, you do it for him. Come on, church, by showing compassion for others, it touches the heart of God. Our, our new vision statement at Crossroads is meeting needs and touching lives. But it's probably written backwards because we touch lives by meeting needs. Think about it. James 1, 27 says, true spirituality that is pure in the eyes of our Father God is to make a difference in the lives of the orphans and widows in their troubles. And, and there's more to the story. A lot of, I've heard this preached so many times, but not the end of it. And to refuse to be corrupted by the world's values. We can't leave that last part off, but just by meeting needs of orphans and widows, we have to make sure that we're not being corrupted by culture's values either, right? That's true spirituality. True spirituality is making a difference in the lives of others. The Aramaic can be translated as true ministry. So true ministry is making a difference in the lives of others. True ministry takes place when we meet needs and touch lives. Right? But if we aren't doing these things, what are we doing? If believers aren't ministering to others, if the church isn't ministering to its community, is that true ministry? And if not, what does that make it? 
What's the opposite of true? It, many ministries are operating under a false ministry because it's become a business transaction. Uh, what is it? Uh, pastors aren't in it for the income. They're in it for the what? Outcome. Ministry isn't... We should be in it for the outcome, right? Touching, meeting lives. It all belongs to him. Whatever he's given us, it, it, he gave it. It's all his. And so we need to devote whatever we can to his work, to true ministry. So Jesus said, when you do it unto them, you do it unto him. But church, there's more to the story. That was verse 40. Let's read verse 45. It says, whatever you did not do unto the least of these, you did not do for me. Come on, let that sink in. Then in verse 46, it says, those people will be condemned to hell as well because of the simple fact that they didn't show compassion for others. That should hit each and every one of us right between the eyes today. Come on, what, this is the same as saying they chose not to care for what Jesus cares for. In essence, they don't carry the heart or the mission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save the lost and not to condemn it. Point number two, to love Jesus is to love others. It's that simple. To love Jesus is to love others. The, the first and the second greatest commandment. The greatest one is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, body. The second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. But again, don't misinterpret this. Love isn't love. You know, what culture calls love today is not love. It's lust and sin. If who you love or what you love is contrary to God's holy word, that is not love and it should not be accepted nor celebrated in the house of God, in the church, is sin. And the Bible's still clear, sin will send you straight to hell unless you're forgiven, unless you repent of that sin. You can't live a lifestyle of sin and still be repentant at the same time. That's unrepented sin. We do have to love the people that live in sin, though. Amen? We, we, we've got to see them as Jesus sees them. But we, we can't just look at them in judgment, in condemnation. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, of course, right? If you're a believer... We've, we've got to see them how he sees them. The people that he gave his life for, right? He, he, he didn't just die for you and I, right? He gave, he gave his life for everyone so that they might come to him. Everyone won't come to him, but it's a choice. And, and we've got to do everything we can to lead people to him and not away from him. Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35, I give you a new command. Love each other deeply and fully. Remember the ways that I have loved you and demonstrate your love for others in those same ways. Everyone will know you as my followers if you demonstrate your love to others. And this word in, in the verse in, in Greek is called agape. Y'all have all heard agape, love, right? Which is so much more than just a word or an emotion. Agape is an action. In other words, you can't just say it or, or feel it. We, we throw that word around too much today, right? We have to demonstrate it. It has to be shown. It's like the saying, talk is cheap. But actions are revealing. Jesus said, you will know them, that you will know that they are my disciples if they show love to others, not if they say they love others. Like a lot of churches have a mission statement that says we love the world. We, we, we're here to love people. Love them to life. But talk is cheap. Point number three, we reveal who we are by what we do, by our actions, by what we demonstrate. We reveal that we are truly Christ followers by loving his people. But on the other side of the coin, because there's more to the story, we reveal that we really aren't Christ followers by not showing love to his people. 
Jesus told the disciples to feed them. And just like the word agape, this is another action word. Like we can't just say we fed them, Jesus, and we obeyed your command. We, we fed them. We have to actually feed them, right? It's an action word. And it reminds me of when Jesus had the conversation with Simon Peter on the beach. And remember, Jesus told him three times, feed my sheep. Come on, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Simon Peter but you remember he also asked Simon Peter three questions on that day what was the question I'm going to begin to close say it again do you love me come on remember that conversation that, that Jesus had with Simon Peter on the beach and after Jesus had just fixed him a breakfast Jesus really cooked Simon Peter breakfast on the beach that day. It's amazing. He fed him, and then he taught him. Come on. And so Jesus says to Simon Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter says, yes, Jesus, you know I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep, Simon Pete. Today, Jesus might say, feed my sheep, peeps. But then, to make sure Simon Peter truly understood his heart and his mission, he asked him again, Simon, do you love me? Do you really love me? Simon Peter said, yes, Jesus, you know I really love you. And Jesus said, well, really feed my sheep, Pete. But then Jesus asked him a third time, and you know, Simon Peter, he gets frustrated with Jesus with this question again and again and again. And Jesus says, do you really, really, really love me, Simon Peter? And Simon Peter says, yes, Jesus, you know all things. You know I really, really, really love you. And Jesus said, well, really, really, really feed my sheep. And remember, Jesus is, in this passage, Jesus is also using that word agape. And so he's teaching Simon Peter that it's not just enough to say that you love me. It's not just enough to, to feel love, but it's a demonstration of love. And the only way that you could truly show that you love me, Simon Pete, is to feed my sheep. If I could get everyone to stand. I want to take a moment and put ourselves in Simon Peter's sandals on this beach, in this moment, standing before Jesus face to face, having the same conversation. Because if you haven't had it already, you better know that you're going to have it. Jesus isn't going to let us get off that easy. And so every head bowed, every eye closed. I, I want you to, to see this to envision this. So Jesus is standing before you and he says, Cindy, Dave, Judy, Jody, Tim, Coley, Mark, Kim, Andy, Kylie, Jacob, Angie, do you love me? Go ahead and answer him. You, you don't have to say it out loud, but just, just talk to him. Do you love me? What is your response? Jesus says, and feed my sheep. But just so that you truly understand his heart and his mission, he's going to ask you again. Do you really love me? Come on, answer Jesus right here, right now. Cindy, do you really love me? Bob, do you really? Daniel, do you really? Was your answer in word? Or is it in deed? Do you indeed love Jesus? Are you feeding his sheep? Because talk is cheap. 
And so for a third time, he wants us to truly examine our hearts in this moment. I want, I want you to envision sheep. Come on. You know, when you're a child and you can't go to sleep and your mom says count sheep, begin to count the sheep that you see. Wandering sheep, broken, battered, addicted, messed up, far from the shepherd. Start naming those sheep. Do you got that in mind? Do you see one lost sheep? If you do, open your eyes and look at me. This is the third time Jesus says, do you really, really, really love me? What's your response? Jesus says, really, really, really go feed my sheep. Go minister to my people. Go, go, go reach the lost, the people that, that are so broken. You know that he wants to fill this place up with broken, battered, addicted, jacked up, messed up people. Because remember, the Bible says that he leaves the 99 righteous to go after the one. And then when the one comes home, that, that all of heaven throws this great big party, this celebration of a sinner coming home, repentant of their sins. Now, I've never read in the Bible, Pastor Tom, where, where Jesus and, and all the angels in heaven throw a great big party because we all gathered for church. I've never read that. Not, not once. Because it doesn't say it, Becky. But it does say that there's a great big party and celebration in heaven that all the angels join in on when one sinner comes home because, because that's how important lost people are to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who's, whose heart breaks when he has to condemn them to hell he, he doesn't want to, they do they condemn themselves by not receiving and believing in Christ and so through this conversation with Simon Peter and with you and I today Jesus reveals one very important principle we reveal our love for him by loving his people by feeding his people by reaching ministering his people and so as we leave this place today my challenge for you church is to go demonstrate his love for the lost for the broken the bound the addicted and, and you don't have to go across the country you, you, some of you don't even have to go across the street. We're surrounded by lost people.